tonight, a young man in court on manslaughter charges over a horror crash in Rivervale that killed three friends. Good evening, Charlotte Hamlin with ABC News. WA Liberal leader Libby Metham tells the party faithful they can achieve the unexpected at the next election. Israel's Prime Minister vows revenge on Iran after a drone strike near his home. And a warm welcome in Sydney for King Charles and Queen Camilla on their first day of public engagements. A 22-year-old man is facing a lengthy jail term after crashing a ute into a house in the Perth suburb of Rivervale, killing three friends and injuring two others. It comes as a further two fatalities were recorded overnight, taking the state's road toll to 146 as police again plead with parents to talk to their children about road safety. Flowers for those lost on our roads. Three young men killed here early Saturday morning. Another two in a serious condition in hospital with head injuries. Many gathering to show their respect, among them a former teacher. Just slow down. Just appreciate everything you've got all the time you've got. Make the most of every day. Look after your mates, love your family and just be careful on the road. 22-year-old Zach Thomas Halen was driving the white ute when it veered off Orong Road at an alleged speed of 114 kilometres an hour, more than 40 above the limit, hitting a tree before spinning around and smashing into the back of a brick house. He was the only one among his friends wearing a seatbelt and blew a preliminary alcohol level of 0.095. He's now facing three counts of manslaughter and two counts of dangerous driving causing grievous bodily harm. Mr Halen, who sustained three spinal fractures in the accident, appeared in court via audio link from hospital, his parents visibly distressed. The magistrate denying bail despite police prosecutors not opposing it based on the seriousness of the charges. Mr Halen's lawyer told the court her client's future before the crash had been bright, having graduated ducks of his school with the goal of becoming an astrophysicist. His life and that of so many around him changed forever. People need to listen to this message because it can happen to you. I particularly wanted to point out young drivers and inexperienced drivers and the need for parents to have that conversation with their children. Just to remind them how important they are to the family and how much of a loss it would be without them and how they need to abide by the road rules. A further two deaths near Lancelin overnight has seen WA's road toll rise yet again, now up to 146, well above the last five-year average for the same time period. Brianna Shepherd. ABC News. Liberal leader Libby Metham has laid out her party's path back to government four months out from the state election. Improving the health system is top of her agenda, announcing a new policy to slash the elective surgery wait list. In a rally cry to party faithful, Libby Metham insists the unthinkable is within reach. I believe we can and will win government with a well-worn strategy to get there. We stand for a better health system. We stand for stronger law and order. We stand for restoring our regions, more homes, and importantly, cost of living pressures for households. She promised a Liberal-led government would pay for elective surgeries to be performed in private hospitals if patients can't be seen within medically recommended times in the public system. A similar idea was trialled more than a decade ago, hampered by a stretched private health system. Well, we've only done 16 in total and, and have to say that the proposal we put forward hasn't worked. It's been revisited since, with public hospitals now having struck deals with private operators for certain patients based on clinical need. The potential for an expansion welcomed by the sector, especially as private hospitals claim their funding isn't keeping pace with rising costs. If this is a way that the state government can provide meaningful support to the private hospitals so that they can keep doing what they do, um, then that is certainly something we would welcome. The Liberals' priorities, including in health, are all about going back to basics to get more MPs back in there. To go one step further, though, and win back government would require picking up dozens of seats, many more than is thought to be possible. A prediction not weighing the party down. The Liberal Party's story is far from over. 
Our best chapters are still yet to be written. There's little time to waste with the start of the next chapter just four months away. Kean Burke, ABC News. The ACT's longest serving Chief Minister, Andrew Barr, has led Labor to an historic seventh term in government. Early in last night's vote count, it appeared the Canberra Liberals may have done enough to end Labor's 23 years in power, but it soon became clear Labor would retain its 10 seats. And though the Greens lost three seats, including those of two ministers, they held enough ground to open the way for another Labor-Greens coalition government. Two independent candidates are also set to join the Legislative Assembly. There's a little bit of counting to go, but it, it does look that the crossbench will be five and five people who hold progressive values and whose natural partner would be a Labor government. They certainly have cemented uh, themselves in the history books uh, as they embark perhaps on another coalition government. Dozens of people have been killed and more are thought to be trapped under rubble following an Israeli airstrike in northern Gaza. Hamas-run authorities say 73 people died in the attack on Beit Lahia, but Israel disputes that. Details are emerging slowly because Israel has restricted media access to the area. The news comes as Israeli forces continue to attack Hezbollah targets in Beirut. The Israeli army strikes buildings in Beirut, not long after what it says was an attempted attack on Israel's leader. This morning, three drones infiltrated from Lebanon. Two of them were intercepted and a third hit a structure in Caesarea as an attempt to target the Prime Minister. He wasn't at home at the time and there were no casualties, but Mr Netanyahu is clear about who he thinks is to blame, posting on social media, the attempt by Iran's proxy Hezbollah to assassinate me and my wife today was a grave mistake. It came as Israel declassified more footage of Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar. These shots showing him and his family in underground tunnels the day before the October 7th attacks last year. And this, the moment he was killed by Israeli forces in Gaza. There had been hopes, particularly those voiced by Western leaders, that the killing of Yahya Sinwar would be an opportunity for Israel to end its conflicts in Gaza and Lebanon. But the prospect of a ceasefire seems increasingly unrealistic, with Israel, Hamas and Hezbollah continuing to fight on. The numbers of casualties have been, civilian casualties have been far too high. Uh, we'd like to see, um, you know, Israel scale back on some of the strikes that it's taking, in it, you know, especially in and around Beirut. In Gaza, the destruction continues. This house in a refugee camp reduced to rubble. Local media saying a whole family of 11 died here. Why this crime? Why this hatred? Why are these massacres being committed against the sleeping and unarmed civilians? And as Israel and Hamas vow to fight on, many are left asking, when will this war end? Matthew Doran, ABC News, Jerusalem. King Charles and Queen Camilla have greeted cheering crowds on their first day of public engagements in Sydney. It's the King's 17th visit to Australia, but his first as head of state. He came bearing a gift for the nation's oldest parliament, praising the power of representative democracy. The King and Queen started their Sunday in Sydney at church. With a song and a signature, their majesties were off, greeting locals. When I realised that the King and Queen were just in my neighbourhood, I couldn't resist coming down to see them. I welcomed them to Sydney and I wished the King all the very best for his cancer treatment. And he said, thank you very much, I really appreciate your wishes. Excited fans from across the country waited for a chance to meet the King. G'day, you've actually read it from Tasmania. Some were already pen pals. Billy was lucky enough to receive a letter in response to one he wrote to the King a little while ago. The King's next stop was the familiar steps of the New South Wales Parliament. He visited in 1974 as Prince of Wales. I'm greeting His Royal Highness as the President of the Legislative Council and the Speaker of the Assembly. On the 150th anniversary of the Upper House. I should remind you that in company with convicts, lunatics and peers of the realm, <laughs> I am ineligible to vote. <laughs> With a fanfare, 
he entered for the first time as sovereign. Please join me in welcoming His Majesty the King. For an event celebrating the bicentenary of the Legislative Council, Australia's oldest legislative body. Incidentally, I first came to Australia nearly, nearly 60 years ago, which is slightly worrying. He presented a gift to the Parliament. It is, in fact, an hourglass, a speech timer. His sense of humour unchanged. And within 15 minutes, he was gone. The King didn't stay for lunch, but no doubt His Majesty would have given guests plenty to talk about. Attendees included parliamentarians from across the political spectrum. The King missed out on a menu including octopus, duck and macaroons to receive the Governor-General, Sam Mostyn, and Governor of New South Wales, Margaret Beasley, as he prepares for a busy day in the nation's capital tomorrow. Alexander Lewis, ABC News. Michigan is considered a must-win state for Kamala Harris if she's to take the White House in the next month's presidential election. But the situation in the Middle East is threatening her support among a key constituency in the Midwestern battleground, Arab Americans. The widening of the conflict in Lebanon has been the final straw for some in the community. They're turning to a third-party candidate, Jill Stein, in protest at the administration's staunch support of Israel. North America correspondent Barbara Miller is in Dearborn, Michigan. On the outskirts of Detroit, America's first Arab majority city. A proud community built up around the jobs migrants from the Middle East found in the auto industry. But today in Dearborn, they're hurting. It's tearing us apart. As Israel strikes Lebanon, Sam Hamoud is desperately worried about family back home. I'm talking about my village, my people, my cousins. My old man has been running all over the country trying to find a safe place to stay. Addressing on the side, I guess. Gotcha. Sam Hamoud backed Donald Trump in 2016 and 2020, but this time he might not vote at all. This is two administrations that are just want to pound, pound, pound bombs. And they're all US-made bombs. And I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm in this whole situation because they're using our tax dollars. In Michigan's Democratic primary election, more than 100,000 people voted uncommitted in protest at the Biden administration's staunch support of Israel. No, no. And in the final weeks of campaigning, some have gone further. Salaam sister. The Abandon Harris campaign endorsing Green Party candidate Jill Stein, who's called for a ceasefire in Gaza and an end to military aid to Israel. We have to register our protest. We cannot be silent. We want to punish this administration, uh, the Harris-Biden uh, administration, for committing genocide. If Trump wins, so... What is it he's going to do that we have not seen already? Jill Stein is polling at around 1%, but that's enough to worry the Democrats. Third-party votes in, in the United States, uh, it's, it's unfortunate, but um, they have the, the potential to be spoiler candidates. Democrats blame Jill Stein for robbing them of victory when she took votes in key swing states in 2016, and they're now targeting her. She's not sorry she helped Trump win. That's why a vote for Stein is really a vote for Trump. Well, we actually say bring it on because every time they try to smear us, they produce a huge counter reaction. Jill Stein makes no excuses for drawing votes from the main parties. For the most part, people are not supporting that candidate. They're voting against the candidate that they hate the most. This is not... A, this is not what democracy needs. It's a vote for Jill Stein. It's not a vote for Trump and it's not a vote for the Democrats. Sujud Hamadi is a Dearborn lawyer. She was a long-term Democratic voter, but this time she'll be backing Jill Stein. If they want our vote, then they need to do what it takes to garner our vote instead of pushing our backs up against the wall and telling us to vote for the lesser of two evils. We love this place. We With love polls Detroit. neck and neck, Thank both Donald much. Trump and Kamala Harris are making multiple campaign stops in Michigan. It's a significant concern, I think, for the Harris campaign. If they can limit the damage and turn up, uh, turn up the, the heat on the African-American turnout, that's that's maybe that's enough, right? 
But Trump is, is doing the same thing in other parts of the state with other constituencies. Donald Trump caused an upset when he took Michigan in 2016 by 11,000 votes. Now, Joe Biden won it back for the Democrats in 2020 with 154,000 votes. And it just shows you how small shifts in a community like this one could determine who wins the White House. In a race that once again is down to the wire. Barbara Miller, ABC News, Dearborn, Michigan. A new political era in Indonesia has begun as Prabowo Subianto is sworn in as president. The 73-year-old takes the helm of Southeast Asia's largest nation, pledging to make it an economic powerhouse. From Jakarta, here's Indonesia correspondent Bill Bertels. Akan memenuhi kewajiban Presiden Republik Indonesia. This moment was decades in the making. Prabowo Subianto has long sought the country's top job. Now this blue blood of Indonesian political and military circles has promised to rule for the country's most vulnerable. Kita harus mengerti selalu. A free nation is a nation where the people are free. People need to be free from fear, poverty, hunger, lack of education, oppression and suffering. The former general was ousted from the military once over brutal tactics against opponents of his then father-in-law, the dictator Suharto. Prabowo was later reborn as a perennial presidential candidate. With the backing of his former rival, the popular outgoing president, Joko Widodo, he won a landslide election victory earlier this year. He's expected to have a bigger voice on the world stage than his predecessor. We have to show solidarity. We must defend all the oppressed people in the world. That's why we support freedom for Palestinians. The beginning of the Prabowo era marks the end of a decade of Joko Widodo, but the outgoing leader won't be far from the centre of power. His son, Gibran Rakabuming Raka, is the new vice president. At 37, he's seen as a sign of continuity and a symbol of how his father will continue to have influence behind the scenes. Bill Bertels, ABC News, Jakarta. Heavy rain has lashed the Italian island of Sicily, causing flooding and widespread damage. Emergency workers rescued residents who'd climbed to safety on their roofs after the Salso River burst its banks. The island had been in the grip of a months-long drought. More oversized machinery will be out on the roads in the grain-growing regions of Western Australia with the beginning of harvest for farmers. But heavy vehicle drivers in the Great Southern say impatient road users are putting lives at risk when they try to overtake slow-moving machines. Rob Mitchell's office is hard to miss. I'm driving a self-propelled boom spray. It's 3.2 metres wide, 4 metres high off the ground. The spraying contractor travels along main roads from farm to farm. I'm maximum doing 50 kilometres an hour. Yeah, people just don't seem to have a bit enough patience. It's this lack of tolerance from road users that could have ended in tragedy. Right down a road, a school bus full of kids decided that me turning my indicator on to turn right was the signal to overtake me. A mate of mine's young fellow was on the bus and blew the wind up me a bit. The most recent near miss prompted Rob to speak up about the dangers of drivers using their right flicker as an indicator to overtake their trucks or caravans. The headline won't read, um, school bus hits sprayer. It'll be sprayer hit school bus and that's yeah that's not good for anyone the trucking industry is also raising the alarm oh, we don't know your ability is the main thing that's the problem what's causing confusion is when heavy vehicles are turning motorists take their flicker as an indication to overtake as a nation and as a society we actually like to help people and we think we're helping and it's not it's a really 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 bad habit Police are also on the lookout and are pleading for caution. In good faith, if they do indicate right um, to tell the person behind, that can create an unsafe overtaking manoeuvre. The person behind should only overtake when they actually assess what's in front of them and they deem it safe that they can go through. With harvest beginning for some, more and more oversized vehicles like this one behind me are going to be out on our roads. That's why operators like Rob and Glenn are asking for people to slow down and be more patient. Kate Forrester, 
ABC News, Katanning. Carbon credits are supposed to offset emissions released into the atmosphere. Alan Kohler takes a look at what the data says about how they're working. There's a bit more than two trillion tonnes of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, normally expressed as parts per million. That's about 700 billion tonnes more than 200 years ago, and that's what's dangerously heating the planet. And this is roughly what a tonne of carbon dioxide looks like. Now, one way we're dealing with this problem is by paying people to get it out of the atmosphere. And the system for achieving that is by giving them a certificate for every tonne of CO2 that they're responsible for removing. And they can sell that on the market. These are also called offsets. Right now, you can get $37 for one of those certificates on the Australian market. That transaction is really the basis of Australia's plan to reduce carbon dioxide emissions to 43% of 2005 levels by 2030 and net zero by 2050. The companies that do most of the emitting are supposed to reduce their emissions, but they can't. So they're allowed to buy those offsets instead. Most of them come from something called human-induced regeneration, which means land management to help native forests regrow and soak up carbon dioxide, as long as they wouldn't have grown anyway. But some researchers at ANU and the University of New South Wales have published the following graph in a paper debunking the whole system. The vertical green bar is when 75% of the human-induced regeneration projects were registered. The line is the amount of forest cover in the areas covered by the scheme. It's increased, so some carbon dioxide is out of the atmosphere, but not much. And anyway, it was increasing before the humans that are inducing the regeneration started earning their certificates. In fact, there's a global controversy about the integrity of offsets. Someone in the United States has just been charged with fraud for selling fake offsets. It's an argument that's not going to go away, and it's central to the whole project of dealing with climate change. Maybe we'll just have to, I don't know, reduce emissions. It's time for sport now with Tom Wildey. Tom, a poor start from the Perth glory. Yeah, new season, but the same story, Charlotte, as they conceded six goals to MacArthur FC in Campbelltown in new manager David Zrilich's first league game in charge. In a blistering first half, the Bulls scored a goal every nine minutes as they stormed to a 5-0 half-time lead. Adam Bergeria finally scored for the glory in the 73rd minute with their deflected shot looping into the net. The Glory have now conceded 25 goals in its past four A-League matches, scoring just five times. To netball, and the Australian Diamonds have lost the opening game of the Constellation Cup against the New Zealand Silver Ferns in Wellington this evening. The home side was clinical in the 14-goal win, its seventh straight against Australia on home soil. Australia's biggest challenge became immediately obvious, trying to shut down 193 centimetre tall goal shooter Grace Nowecki. Two on the board as quick as you like. Her 96% shooting accuracy in the first half had the world number one side in shambles, and New Zealand's stellar second quarter saw them take a nine goal lead into half time. It was an improved third quarter for the Diamonds, who narrowed the deficit, but the Silver Ferns closed out the game, taking the 64 to 50 win, their biggest against Australia in 14 years. They continue their dominance at home with yet another win. Yeah, they obviously played extremely well, and um, we didn't, to be honest. So lots to uh, learn from that game, and obviously uh, three to go. So we're really looking for some a better performance the next time. Earlier this afternoon, the Australian Kelpies thrashed New Zealand by 50 goals in the first game of the Trans-Tasman Cup. The Kelpies were dominant from the beginning and extended a nine-point quarter-time lead to 23 at the big break. Jerome Gilbard and Brodie Roberts showed their experience as a combination before being replaced by a whole new attacking line which continued to fire. A stunning play from the Kelpies. And their defence was just as clinical. The Kelpies finished 84 to 34 victors. We've been building connections for a long time. Lots of us have been in this program for three years. And then to get out here today, we just put it all into practice, which is exactly what we wanted. The second game of the four-match series will be played in Auckland on Wednesday. Anthea Moody, ABC News. Australian golfer Hannah Green has won the ladies' championship at Suwon Hills in South Korea. The 27-year-old from Perth had a one under par 71 in her final round to finish one shot ahead of Frenchwoman Celine Boutier. 
It was Green's sixth win on the LPGA Tour and her third victory this year. It's difficult to win tournaments, but um, I think having experienced it and having confidence um, on the right side of things, it, it makes it easier. But don't get me wrong, I was still really nervous playing those last three holes. <laughs> Spain's Marc Marquez has claimed a remarkable come-from-behind victory at the Phillip Island MotoGP, overtaking championship leader Jorge Martin in the dying stages of the race. Australian Jack Miller finished in 11th place as the Spanish riders once again dominated on the track. Blue skies greeted riders and fans on Phillip Island and the stars were out too. We've got perfect conditions, not too much wind, so many riders in contention and I'm hoping Jorge can take it out from the front. Championship leader Jorge Martin had pole position and a shaky start from rival Marc Marquez helped him take the early lead. But an awful start for Marquez. The replay revealing a visor tear off to be the culprit. He was stuck under his rear tyre and that was why he didn't get the purchase because his rear tyre wasn't sat on tarmac. While Martin was happily out in front, Marquez had to pick his way through the field, eventually catching up with the leader and a cat and mouse battle ensued. This has been an absolutely awesome ride by Jorge Martin. With four laps left, Marquez made his move. Martin, Martin soon snatched it back. What a showdown we have in this But Marquez wasn't done with yet. Forces Martin to give way. And three laps later, the chequered flag was in sight. An incredible finish to the Australian Grand Prix. Mar Marquez brings the thunder down under. A show of sportsmanship between the duelling riders before the celebrations began. The eight-time world champion claiming his fourth Phillip Island title after the disastrous start. I saw it. I tried to remove, but uh, it was impossible. And in fact, when I released the clutch, I started to spin. In the beginning, I was a bit stressful, but uh, super happy for the victory. The usual fanfare followed by an Australian tradition capping off a victory to remember. Aaron Marcicovetere, ABC News. Australian boxer Tim Zhu has had a crushing loss to Russian Bakram Mortazaliev in the world title fight in Florida. The IBF junior middleweight world champion knocked down Zhu four times in a brutal display. The 29-year-old had been hoping to claim the world title after losing his previous fight in March. With a minute to go in just the third round, Zhu's camp threw in the towel and he lost by technical knockout. The Sydney-born boxer paid tribute to his opponent. The better man won tonight, no excuses right there. He just uh, was that bit better. And uh, yeah, again, no excuses. I tried my best and these things happen. And Sharp, that's the latest in sport. Thanks very much, Tom. To the weather now and after a pretty gloomy afternoon in Perth right now, it's 14 degrees and the humidity is 93%. The city's minimum was 12 at half past four this morning with a top of 22.6 at lunchtime. Wandering had the state's coolest minimum of six degrees, while the heat continued in the north, 42 the top at Fitzroy Crossing. To the satellite, there are showers and storms coming from the cloud bubbling over the far northeast of the state, and an approaching front is sending gusty showers to the far southwest. A deep trough over inland WA is moving east ahead of the cold front in the southwest. A new ridge will develop over the south tomorrow. A weak trough extends from the Kimberley into the east Pilbara. Around the country tomorrow, a possible shower in Sydney. Fine for Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide and Canberra. Cloud clearing for Hobart and a possible storm in Darwin. Back to WA, it is staying hot up north. There's the chance of an afternoon shower or thunderstorm over most parts of the Kimberley, the north interior and northeastern parts of the south interior. A cooler change through eastern parts of the southwest land division, goldfields and Eucla. Windy at times over central and eastern parts of the state. And light showers are forecast for western and southern districts of the southwest land division, contracting to the coast during the morning. In Perth, partly cloudy with a slight chance of a shower in the early morning and the chance of fog about the hills, a top of 20 after a low of 11. Sunrise will be at half past five and setting at 6.33. Looking ahead, a bit of cloud lingering on Tuesday, 21, but then sunny midweek, 25 on Wednesday, 29 Thursday, and looking like a very pleasant end to the week, 25 the top Friday and Saturday, 27 degrees on Sunday. 
And that is ABC News for this weekend. Stay up to date with ABC News Online or catch the latest anytime on iView. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night.